Hi guys, welcome to another section of Living with Perclass. I am Tutor Chima. And today we are going to be running off Jam Biology 2019. So that means we are going to be solving questions um, 46 to 50. Now this is so because in our previous video we solved questions 41 to 45. So today we are going to be solving 46 to 50 and rounding up the section. Before we proceed, so do not forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, like our videos. You can drop one or two comments on our comment section box. A comment can be a question, maybe on this video, on the previous video I've done and you want me to maybe throw more light on one or two things. Feel free to ask one or two questions. If you also look below there, you will see a notification bell. I advise that you click it on and make it active. When you do so, you will always be the first to be notified whenever we have an educational content like this on our channel. You can be kind enough to share our videos so that it's going to reach as much viewers as possible. So now, let us move in and round off this section. A germinating seed requires oxygen, which is essential for. A germinating seed requires oxygen, which is essential for. Is it converting carbohydrate into glucose? Is it transporting energy from one part of the plant to another? Is it the production of energy by oxidizing um, essential carbohydrate? Is it by hydrolysis? Is it by hydrolysis of protein? So why does a germinating seed require oxygen? So I say that the oxygen is essential for cellular respiration. This oxygen is used to oxidize carbohydrates, that is glucose, to release energy. So the reason why a germinating seed requires oxygen is for it to respire. Respiration is not breathing in of oxygen and taking out of carbon dioxide. No, respiration is a process whereby living organisms break down glucose to release energy. And this can be done in the presence or in the absence of oxygen. So why does a germinating seed require oxygen? It requires oxygen so that it uses oxygen to break down glucose, that's carbohydrate, to release energy. So the answer is the production of energy by oxidizing essential carbohydrates. 47. Which of the following is obtained from analyzing sweat from the skin? Okay, which of the following obtained from analyzing sweat from, his, from the skin is not an excretory product? Which of the following obtained from analyzing sweat from the skin is not an excretory product? Water, salt, dust, urea, of course, you know that your skin cannot bring out dust. The dust is just from the air that now settles on the skin. So I said that sweat is made up of water, salt, and urea. Dust is not a part of sweat. Dust is just from the atmosphere that now cling on our body and stay on our wet skin when we sweat. So sweat is not, um, dust is not a uh, part of it. So the answer is dust. 48. In the full chain shown in the diagram, the secondary consumer is, look at the food chain, one soil, two grasses, three insects, four toads, five snakes, bacteria. So this means that soil um, grasses we use grow on soil. Insects we feed on some of these grasses. Toad we feed on some of these insects. Snakes comes and feed the toads. When the snakes die, bacteria will decompose them. So in the food chain shown. In the diagram, the secondary consumer is let's now open it up, analyze it. Grass that produces food from photosynthesis and grow on the soil is a producer. The insects that feed on the grasses first are the primary consumers or consumer. So the insects fall under primary consumer. The toads that now feed on the insect are the secondary consumer. The snakes that feed on the toes are the tertiary consumer, and the bacteria that feed on the snakes and decomposes them are called decomposers. So the question says, um, in the food chain shown below, the diag in the diag food chain in the diagram, the secondary consumer is asking us secondary consumer. So the secondary consumer is toad, which is four. So the secondary consumer is four. Forty-nine. In a breeding program, a cross was made between two true 
breeding cowpea types. Two, two, two true breeding cowpea types. One with round seeds and the other with wrinkled seeds. If the roundness is dominant, while the wrinkledness is recessive, in the first filial generation, all the seeds produced will be C25% wrinkle, 75% round, 100% wrinkle, 50% wrinkle, 50% round, 75% wrinkle, 25% round. Now, what are true breeds? I said that true breeds are pure breeds. Or true breeds, which are pure breeds, are parents who are homozygous for every trait. Now, since they said that two true breed or pure breed of cowpea, that means one parent has only round seed, the other one has only wrinkled seed. It doesn't, the one that has round seed does not have a gene for wrinkle in it. That's why it's a pure breed or a true breed. The one that has wrinkled seed does not have a gene for roundness in it. That's why it's a pure breed. So you are crossing wrinkle and round. You are crossing round and wrinkle. So, so the thing they say that one is dominant over the other. They say that if the roundness is dominant, why the wrinkleness is recessive. So I said, um, let the threads round. Let the dominant thread, which is round, be big R. Why the recessive threads wrinkle be small R? You can use R for round and use W for wrinkle. No, when we are doing gene crossing, we use the same alphabet for the two contrasting threads with the same alphabet. Mm -hmm. But the dominant one carries the big letter. The recessive one carries the small letter. So the dominant thread round with capital letter R, the recessive threads wrinkle with small letter R. So pure breeds, that means the parents are, they have only round, this one has only gene for roundness, this one has only gene for wrinkleness. So we are crossing them. So we cross each of them, we are mating them, these are crossing them, this you have big or small, this, this you have big or small, this and this, they are bigger or smaller, this and this. So if you look at after crossing this and this bigger or smaller, this one with this one bigger or smaller, this and the second one bigger or smaller, this and the this and this bigger or smaller, this and this. This crossing is not, this is also cross with this and cross it's like I've made a slight mistake on the crossing I cross this one and this one twice and I cross this one and what well, the point is that this one will cross with this one to get bias more this one will cross with the second one I made a mistake in the array mm -hmm. So this, when these two crosses with these two, you have bigger, small, bigger, small, bigger, small, bigger, small R in all. So it's supposed to be this one crossing with this one to get bigger, small. This one crossing with the second one to get bigger, small. This R is supposed to go here. This one crossing with this one to get bigger, small. This one crossing with this one to get bigger. If you cross all of them properly after doing the crossing properly, mm -hmm. you are going to have, I said that the, since R is dominant over small R, all the offsprings will be physically round, therefore 100% round. So if you do the crossing properly, they will all be, we have a 100% round. So all of the offspring, because these two will cross with these two, I are going to get Bigger or small, bigger or small, bigger or small, bigger or small. So since R is dominant over small, all the offsprings will be physically round. So you can see that all the offsprings will be physically round. So therefore, we have hundred percent round, hundred percent round. So the correct answer is hundred percent round. There is no answer here. Everything is supposed to be, so everything is supposed to be hundred percent round since. Big R is dominant over small R, so it's supposed to be 100% round. So your correct answer is 100% round, so there's no answer there. The diagram represents an experiment with two types of soils. This experiment is to demonstrate. The diagram represents an experiment with two types of soils. This experiment is to demonstrate. 
You see the soil attraction for water? Is it soil porosity? Is it soil capillarity? Is it draining capacity of the soil? Is it soil permeability? Of course, you can see in this experiment, soils are placed in an open-ended tube and that depth in water and water now rise to the tubes. So the rise of water in tubes or fall of water in narrow tiny tubes like this is known as capillarity. So capillarity is a rise or fall of water in narrow capillary tubes. So because of that, we are looking at the soil capillarity. Hmm? Soil capillarity. All right, guys, we've come to the end of today's session of Learning with Prep class where we looked at past questions on jam biology 20. 19. We solved questions 46 to 50 running on this section. If you look below here, you will see a link. I urge you to copy and paste this link on your browser. When you do so, it's going to take you straight to our SAR group. When you join our SAR group, you'll be getting updates and infos on the latest videos or content we have on YouTube. So, till you meet again, I remain Sachima. Bye and do stay safe.